Bless you. Welcome to our online Bible study. And it is the day the Lord has made. I'm rejoicing. Glad to be in it. Glad to have you here. Go ahead, start a watch party. Start a watch party. Share this on your line so that some other folks can join us in our Bible study tonight. Welcome aboard. Welcome above aboard. Got a whole lot to share. I'm going to try to do it in a short period of time. So I'm going to try to compress a lot into your hearing tonight. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that as it goes through this internet, that your revelation flows freely in the mind and spirit of your people. I pray, God, that you'll wake something up in our spirits tonight as we seek to glorify you in the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. I'm just going to say this up front. Well, I'll greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, or as my one of my brothers pick on me and say, I greet you in divine love tonight. It's good to have you here. I give reverence to God to to tonight, give reverence to our leadership. And of course, we honor our first lady, uh, my wife, your first lady. Glad to have you online tonight with us as we open up this word. I have to say, this 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 lesson has, has kind of been a challenge for me because uh, as one of my other brothers said to say to me that I need to try and squeeze uh, messages and stuff into bite-sized chunks. So I'm gonna try to squeeze this, it's a whole lot of ground that I'm gonna cover, but I'm trying to put it in bite-sized chunk where it'll serve those of you who who wanna study even more, it'll give you some, some targets to dig into as you seek to understand the word of God and walk in faith and understand how you are to walk out your faith in the earth. So we're on house rules, this is part number eight, so let's get going. House rules are, uh, as I said before, codes of behavior or norms that determine the operating uh, climate or style of a house or an organization. I've said with you from the White House to crack house, from the schoolhouse to the church house, from my house to your house, uh, house rules are expected to be observed and or obeyed. House rules are often unwritten, but understood. For instance, I always use the example of certain seats in certain homes and certain churches and certain organizations. Certain people have certain seats and there's a price to pay if you end up not following the rules of the house. But uh, I'm setting up Sunday, the finale on Sunday to say that the house always wins. Now, I, as I've said before, the rules of the house determine the order and strength of the house. I've shared with you that building inspectors use codes to determine if a building or houses are suitable to occupy and that these codes differ from place to place. So as we press forward, just with, with a, a, a real small review, I remember on Sunday I shared with you that the Hebrew word for son and the Hebrew word that is translated house comes from the same root word, which means to build. That means the building or the house that God is building is really a son or a royal destiny. Christ is the royal destiny the Father is building from the house, the house of David. So tonight we're going to take a quick journey through scripture to connect the ark to the ark. The ark to the ark. So uh, if you go to Revelation, I want to show you. The real ark or the original ark. Revelation 11, I'm sorry, verse 19. I want to show you very quickly the real ark. Revelation, back in your Bible, verse 19. I want to show you the real ark. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. It says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his, of his covenant was seen in the temple. And there were 
lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake and a great hail. So this is the ark seen in heaven, but it is the ark that Moses was told to use as a pattern for the ark that originated in the Mosaic tabernacle, moved to the tent of David, and then finally was in Solomon's tent. As I shared with you before, the Ark of the Covenant uh, was, was composed of wood, wood, no, I'm sorry, gold, wood, gold. Gold, wood, gold. I'm using my Bible. Gold speaks of deity. Wood speaks of humanity. The wood was acacia wood, and that wood was incorruptible. So the Ark was a demonstration or a type of Jesus Christ because he, he was, according to Colossians, Colossians, it pleased the Father that in him should dwell the fullness of the Godhead. The wood speaks of his humanity. The gold speaks of his deity. Then I said to you that the ark represents the presence, the glory, the power, the throne, the government of God. Get this, this, this next bit. Among his people. It is the presence, the glory, the power, the throne, and the government of God among his people. The Mosaic Tabernacle was in the center of the camp. The ark was the main part in the most holy place of the tabernacle. So everything the ark stood for was meant to recommend, was meant to represent, I'm sorry, the presence, the power, the glory, the throne, the government of God among his people. Because the ark carried the name of the Lord, it represented his, the power and manifestation of the kingdom of God. Said again, because the ark carried the name of the Lord, it represented the power and manifestation of the kingdom of God. It also represented the ministry of the Melchizedek priesthood. If you bring all of this through the, the rent veil and the finished works of Jesus, it speaks of, as I said a minute ago, what Paul described as uh, it, or listed in Colossians when he said, for it pleased the father that in him should all the fullness dwell. We ended Sunday's uh, message talking about peace. So as a quick recap, Solomon's name means peaceful. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You read it on Christmas, but it's a good time to, to, to read it or hear it again. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a son is born, a child is born, I'm sorry. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. The Ark of the Covenant was carried on the shoulders of the Levites. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince. Here it is, of peace. Verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. One more time, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So Isaiah is prophesying, when Jesus come, his government shall continually increase and his peace shall continue to increase. Then it says that gives us the location upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Jesus, David's greatest son, was or is the Prince of Peace. He, Jesus was a priest after the order of or administration of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7 describes Melchizedek as the king of righteousness and the king of Salem, which is king of peace. Let's pick this story up. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 5, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 9. Let's pick this story up with Solomon finishing the temple. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1. In my Bible, that's page 561. Second Chronicles chapter five, verse one. So all the work that Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in, in the things which his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and all the furnishing, and put them in the treasuries of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, in Jerusalem, that he might, that they might bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord up from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore, all the men of Israel assembled with the king at the feast, which was in the seventh month. 
Just in case you don't know, that seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles. That's another lesson for another day. So all the elders of Israel came and the Levites took up the ark. Then they brought up the ark, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. And also Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him before the ark were sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. Then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most high or most holy place under the wings of the cherubims. Under the wings of the cherubim, for the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims overshadowed the ark and its pole. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles of the ark could be seen from the holy place in the in, in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside, and they are there to this day. So Solomon finished the house. Skip down to verse 13. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpets and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they had lifted up their voice with the trumpet and cymbals and, instrument, and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord fill the house of God. I need somebody here to understand. I got, I got a, a big rule for you. It's a, it's a rule. It's simple in, in, in stating, but can be tough in work walking out. We see here the glory filled the house. The house is finished. Everything's in order. They were all on one accord. They were all on one accord. They were all on one accord. And we see glory comes in the house. Here's a rule. Here's a rule. It's a good rule. Prayer, prayer, praise, worship, and unity builds the house. Prayer, praise, worship, and unity builds the house. And all of these must be done from a place of rest. That's from Sunday's message, how God had given David and Solomon rest from all of their enemies. Prayer, praise, worship, unity builds the house. But each of them, or together, they have to be done from a place of rest. And go, go, go to the next chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 39. Here we, we have Solomon's prayer during the house of the house dedication service. Solomon's prayer during the house de dedication service. Chapter 6, verse 39. Chapter 6, 39. Solomon is praying. He says, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, their prayers and their supplication, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Now, my God, I pray, let your eyes be up on, be open and let your ears be attentive to the prayer made in this place. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, to your resting place. You and the ark of your strength, let your priests, O, God, o Lord God, be clothed with salvation and let your saints rejoice in goodness. So here we have Solomon is dedicating the house. He's dedicating the house. He's praying. But, but what he's really saying at the end of this is, Lord, you dwell in heaven. But if you don't come and build the true house, not, there is nothing more here but brick and mortar. If you don't come and dwell, the word dwell, shakan. If you don't come and dwell, shakan, here with us, there is nothing much here but just nice, human, man-made, brick, and more. Go to chapter 7, verse 1. Chapter 7, verse 1. I told you we're going to journey through scripture, but I have you have, you're not turning too hard, so, so we, we'll get through it. Here was it said. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and sacrifice, sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple and the priests could not enter to the, the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. There needs to become a time in the earth 
where the glory of the Lord is so into the house of God that there's no need for us to preach because the, the glory will do the preaching. We don't have to minister when the glory manifests itself in its fullness. The glory filled the house and the priest did not minister. The glory filled the house and the priest did not minister. So in other words, God is answering Solomon's prayer when Solomon's saying, Lord, I need you to feel this place because if you don't feel this place, this is just an empty space. If you don't feel this place, it's just an empty space. So Lord, come from heaven and dwell, Shekin, dwell here in this place. <clears throat> Two things that we can never fully teach or preach. One, the glory of God. Two, the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because they both represent the fullness of God. When the glory cloud comes in, I've said to, you, to this, this to you before, everything that is anti-God leaves the, the room. When the glory comes in, everything that's anti-God leaves the room. Things happen when the glory shows up. But the challenge is, do we put in the work to make sure that the glory shows up? How's that going to happen? Prayer, praise, worship, unity. Prayer, praise, worship, unity. That's the main rule for the night. So let's, let's, let's push, a little for, push, push, push it forward a little bit. Uh, try and find Haggai chapter 2. Try to find Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. Let, let, I'll get there in a minute. I'm going to quote a couple, couple verses. Years after Solomon's death, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, Solomon's temple. The fate of the ark is unknown. There, the, some say that it was taken uh, to Babylon during the Babylonian captivity. There are others who say that Jeremiah hid the ark in preparation for the restoration of the temple. Jeremiah 3, 6 gives us some information. He says, and when you increase and are fertile in the land in those days, declares the Lord, men shall no longer speak of the ark of the Lord, ark of the covenant of the Lord, nor shall it come to mind. They shall not mention it or miss it or make another. So in other words, the, the shift or there's going to be a focus in the shift from the ark to something else. I'm just telling you up front, the, the, sh the focus is going to shift from the ark of the covenant to the ark who is Jesus Christ. That's what I'm telling you up front. The sh focus is going to shift from the physical ark of the covenant to the human ark of the covenant who is Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 3.17 says, at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. See, the ark represents the throne. At that time, when the focus shifts, Jerusalem, that will be where Jesus will be, or, or was birthed, will be called the throne of the Lord. And all nations, get this, all nations shall assembly there in the name of the Lord at Jerusalem. They shall no longer follow the willfulness of their evil heart. Pay attention now. He says, all nations. Remember, earlier I shared with you, uh, in the beginning of the series, or it may have even been the, the previous series, where our, our assignment, final episode, is to disciple all nations, right? Stick with this all nations, because Jeremiah 3.17 again says, the throne shall be in Jerusalem, and all nations shall, shall assemble it there. All nations shall assemble it. That sounds like there'll be a time when it won't be nation against nation. But I, but, but I ask you to go, you should have it by now. Hey, guy, chapter number two. Haggai chapter number two, verse six. Haggai chapter two, verse six. I, I, you know, you can't talk about the glory without going by and seeing what Haggai said. You can't, you can't talk about the glory without going by and seeing what Haggai said. Here's what Haggai six, two, six says. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. Somebody needs to understand something. Could this pandemic be could God be allowing this pandemic to happen to sh shake the global economy, to shake the global, everything global, all nations around the world are being impacted by this pandemic? Could this be a, a not necessarily God doing it, but God, it, it is God allowing it because God is sovereign. So. This global shaking, as I've said to you before, is a global reset. Here's what he says, verse 7. And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Notice here, 
desire, the, the, the predicate, the desire, which means it is singular. Desire is singular. And then it says the, the desires of all nations. All nations uh, will have one desire. It's interesting that other translations, the King James is the only one that used desire. The, most other translations use wealth or treasure or things pointing to wealth, right? So that for me, I'm getting ahead of myself, talks about we have this treasure in earthen vessels. I'm kind of in the Sunday's piece now. But 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 the desire of all nations, the desire of all nations is Jesus Christ, singular, and he shall come. Verse, verse eight, here's something somebody needs to understand. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of, Lord of hosts. I, I, I always want to remind our people, whoever's watching this, God is your source. Everything and everyone else is a resource. God is your source. Everything else and everyone else is a resource. The wealth of the wicked is still laid up for the righteous. But I need you to understand. God says the silver is mine and the gold is mine. All this stuff. Don't, don't get caught up worrying about the economy. Be connected to God because he is your source. Everything else is a resource, right? Here's verse 9. Verse 9 says, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. Former says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Zerub Zerubbabel's temple was not even close to the splendor of Solomon's temple. However, in verse nine, we see that the glory is the glory, not the house that should be greater. God doesn't say the house that's coming is going to be greater. He says the glory that's going to be in this latter temple shall be greater than the glory of the former temple. As we see in Moses, you go back and look at Moses. When Moses assembled his, his, the tabernacle, the glory fell, the priest didn't minister. When Solomon completed his tabernacle, the glory came in, the, the priest couldn't minister. But here in Haggai, we're learning that there's a coming glory that's going to be greater than the glory that, that Shachan dwelled in Moses' tabernacle or Solomon's temple. Are you in this room with me? The Hebrew word for Shekinah is not used in the Old Testament. It, but it, it is, is, is not actually used in the Old Testament. You, you won't find the Hebrew word Shekinah, Shekinah in the Old Testament. It is often used, though, in conjunction, in conversation and teaching with the appearance of the glory of the Lord. But the root word for Shekinah means to dwell, to reside, to remain, or to abide. It is, you've heard me use it actually up to now. It is Shakan. So you don't find Shekinah, but you find Shakan. Shakan means to dwell, to reside, to remain, to abide. The Shekinah glory is the abiding or visible presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I'm staying with, so, so the rest of Haggai 2, 9 says, he says, the Lord of hosts says, and in this place, which place? It is the place where the greater glory dwells. In this place, which place? The place where the greater glory dwells. I will give peace. In this place, I will give shalom. Let me tell you something, beloved. Shalom is bigger than simple peace. It also means, shalom means to bless, to keep safe, to hedge in, to prosper. And to be in hell. This, 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 this shalom piece is similar to salvation or being born again. Salvation is far more than being born again and simply going to heaven when you die. The concept of salvation includes healed, saved, delivered, protected, and to be made whole or complete. So together, shalom and salvation speaks of the comprehensive total blessing, or the abundant life of the believer. Now, like salvation, peace is progressive. In Romans 5.1, we find 
Paul says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is peace with God. The second level uh, or progression of faith is what I shared with you on Sunday is it, it, this Philippians chapter four, seven. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you have the peace with God when you first get saved. That's when you get righteous. Then you have the peace of God. After walking with God for a while, you should start to have the peace of God. But then if we flip back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in you. The, the original Hebrew does not, the original Hebrew says peace, peace instead of perfect peace. I call that a dual enunciation, like verily, verily, or truly, truly. It is, it is once for heaven and once for the earth. It's, it's whatsoever we bind on earth, it's also bound on heaven. Or really the translation means it's already bound in heaven. So peace, peace means I've got, because I have peace by the Lord Jesus Christ, I have peace in my earth, earthly circumstances. Are you in this room with me anywhere? So the apostle Paul says, he writes to the church at Ephesus. He says, we are brought together by the blood of Christ for he is our peace. The blood speaks of the mercy seat. The mercy seat was on the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus then is our mercy seat. Let me go back and grab something from Sunday and pull it into today's conversation. Sunday I talked about in the Davidic Covenant, the Lord promised a house, a.k.a. a posterity. He promised a throne. Also a position, which is a position. He promised a kingdom, which gives us power. But he said it would be forever, which is perpetuity. Isaiah 7, 13 says, then he said, hear now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Verse 14, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin. Not a virgin, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So let's go back, pick up Luke chapter one. We, we did this Sunday, Luke chapter one, verse 30. Luke chapter one, verse 30. Luke chapter one, verse 30. I, I hope you're still with me. I hope you're still with me. I hope you, you're tracking with me because I'm, I'm about to really start put, put, the, put, my hammer, put the hammer down and get out of here. Luke chapter one, verse 30. We read it Sunday, so let me do it real quick. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with, with God. And, and behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a child and uh, shall call his name Jesus. Remember, Isaiah said Emmanuel, which means God with us. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. There will be no end. Just, just, I just want to connect Isaiah back to what we read in, in Luke. And now I'm going to move you. I'm showing you Jesus. I'm putting Jesus. I'm, I'm bringing the ark in the earth. Now get this. Stay with me here. Go back to Matthew because this, 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 this is going to challenge a couple of you. Go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is going to challenge a couple of you. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. I'm sure you can get there real quick. The, the King James says, the book of the generation of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse 17 says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. May I add that up for you? 42, 42. I know some of you, especially the preachers, have used this whole, he came down, down through 40 and two generation line. I want you to consider something. Here, here's what I want you to consider. Generation is singular in verse one and verse 17. Secondly, the word until, or one translation says unto. It is until, not Jesus, but Christ, I'm splitting hairs here. But Galatians, and Paul writes in Galatians 4.19, uh, my children, my little children, I travail with you in birth pains until Christ be formed in you. The house 
the Lord Jesus is building is Christ fully formed in a people. Christ, I believe, from Matthew 1, 1 and Matthew 1, 17, Christ is the 42nd generation. How we get there. Uh, for, for you, you can look at Ephesians chapter 4 later where it talks about the perfect man. Perfect man. 42 is 6 times 7. 6 is man. 7 is the is per perfection. Six is the number of men. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. Six times seven. Man plus completion is the perfect man. Read the rest of that Ephesians text and think of that thought for all you preachers that that, that kind of looking at me kind of funny now. But read the rest of that text and think think about G Christ, not Jesus, Christ. I'm, I'm, yes, I, I am split, splitting a hair here. Christ is the 42nd generation, or said another way, the generation of Christ is the 42nd generation. 42nd generation, a.k.a. the perfect new man. Bam! That's good right there. But I can't hang out. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I got a number of need to go on short time to get there. John 1. John 1. So I'm, I'm trying to birth the, the, the true art in, in your life. John chapter one verse fourteen. John chapter one verse fourteen. Somebody wants to turn 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 the turn the turn the stream off now. Just think through that. Somebody, I'm, I'm, you're gonna have to catch up later. John chapter one verse fourteen. John chapter one verse fourteen. You, you're familiar with. I could have just quoted and gone gone with time. John one fourteen says, "And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father." Full of grace and truth. Now, now let me go back to some for, for, for my preacher, since you really want to do some study, hit some juice because because this is something I'm studying out, and I probably shouldn't say it to the whole world, but I'm gonna just do it anyway. Since, since it's in my in my spirit, I need to just do it so I can get on, get on, get where I'm going. God referred the father refers to the son as my beloved son. This is my beloved, beloved son and son in whom I'm well pleased. If you study the name David, David means beloved. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. If you study the name Hebrew name David, it means beloved of God. Hmm. Beloved of God, my beloved son. Just, just something, just something, just a little sidebar, just a little sidebar. But, but let's get back to John 1, 14. I'm, I'm going to get out of your way. The ark speaks of Jesus in, the, in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. So Jesus, the beloved son, is the ark of the covenant in an earth suit. Jesus. God's beloved son, only begotten son, is the Ark of the Covenant in an earth suit. Remember I said, God is really building a royal dynasty. God is really building a son. I need somebody to understand what God is building is a many-membered body after his firstborn son, Romans chapter 8. In, Rome, in John 17, Jesus prayed, Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. In coming to earth, Jesus laid down his robe in glory and took on the form of a servant. So Jesus, we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father. He laid down his glory to come to earth to demonstrate his glory. Let's watch him demonstrate. Let's watch the first time he demonstrates his glory. Chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, John, chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. You, you're familiar with this story. You, you're familiar, familiar with the story. But jump, jump down for time to, to uh, so, so what happened? Let me just, just in case you're not. Wedding, they run out of wine. Jesus' mother comes to him and say, the host needs some more wine because they're out of wine. And so uh, Jesus said, give me six water pots, six the number of man. And fill them up to the brim, and he changed water into wine. You're familiar with the story. But then verse 11 is what I just wanted to draw your attention to. Here's what it says. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Jesus, the, the wedding feast, water to wine, is a beginning or was a beginning of the manifestation of the glory of Jesus in the earth. The Ark of the Covenant speaks of the glory of God, the 
power of God, the presence of God, the throne of God, the government of God. Jesus is the Ark of the Covenant personified. God is building a house, but he's and when in God's mind, the house is not a physical structure. It is a son, a royal dynasty. Jesus is of the house of David. Now, as, as I go to some familiar passage, let me just, I'll just quote it for time's sake because you, you're familiar with it. Matthew chapter 6, Matthew 16, Matthew 16, somewhere between 13 and 19. Uh, Jesus has a conversation. Who do men say that I am? And they would end with the, some say, some say, some say, some say. Then Jesus asked this question. He said, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter says, thou art the Christ. Jesus says to, to, to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not, key word here, revealed that to you. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my father who's in heaven. I want somebody to hear the word reveal because you have to get to the place of revelation. He says, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, some people have, have made doctrine to say that Peter, that Jesus built the church, his church on Peter. I beg to differ. I don't believe Jesus built his church on Peter. Peter may have been the first pope. However, however that goes. But here's what I want you to understand. I believe it's built on revelation. The house that God is building is not brick and mortar. It's a royal dynasty. It is a member, many membered body fashioned according to his son, the, the firstborn among many brethren under the order or administration of Melchizedek in the house of David. I said a lot in that. I hope you got it or wrote it down. Or later, come back and read it, re, re, rewind and, and get this. But here's a rule. Jesus builds the house. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. But Jesus builds the house based on our revelation of who he is, what he has done, and who we are in him. Jesus is building the house. I, I know many, many pastors, preachers have, have, have visions of building God in physical structure, nice edifice. And that's wonderful. That is wonderful. No shade at all. But what God wants us to concentrate on is building the people. He says, I'm going to build the church. What we've got to do is build in our people the revelation of who Jesus is, what he's done, and what we have based on what he has done. In other words, who we are based on what he's done. Now, I need, I need to just give you some, some something, something that you might think is bad, but it's good. Go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21. Man, I got pretty good time going. Matthew 21. Matthew 21, 12. Matthew 21, 12. Uh, here, here it goes. Matthew 21, 12. Then Jesus went to the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables. You, you're familiar with this? And, and verse 13 is what I want to call your attention to. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned, you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Verse, verse 13 gives us another rule, Pastor Newton. Years ago, years ago, we used to sing a song. Prayer will fix it every time. We used to say prayer is the key, but faith unlocks the door. What happens after we use the key of prayer and faith to unlock the door? What happens after we use the key of prayer and faith to unlock the door? Well, here's the rule. We have to make sure that the house is clean. Once we use prayer as the key and our faith to push open the door, we got to make sure that we're walking in a place that is clean. Mama used to say, mama used to say, mama had a house rule. She used to say, cleanliness is next to godliness. Let me read. You stay here. You familiar. Let me read this. Let me read this. Let me read this. Since we talk about glory, let me read it. Let me we talk about glory. Uh, David writes in uh, Psalm 24. Let me read it. The earth is the Lord and all is fullness. The house and those who dwell therein. 
for it was founded upon the sea and established upon the waters. Who may ascend unto the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? Here it is. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob. Watch this next phrase. The generation, singular, of those who will seek him who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Who shall ascend until the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. We can pray and have faith, but we got to clean our hands. Like with David, David had to get the blood off his hand. David had too much blood on his hand. We have to make sure our hands are mean our work is clean. Are you in this? Are you in this room with me? So, 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 um, got two more verses to go, and we have two more turns to go. Go back to John, or go to John chapter two. John chapter two. Here is another occasion where Jesus, John two to thirteen, John two thirteen. Here's another occasion where Jesus cleansed the temple, and, and for real, we got one other place. Actually, I'm gonna quote the last one. John chapter two, verse thirteen. In John chapter 2, verse 13, we find after Jesus turned water to wine, he then goes into the temple and cleanses the temple. I'm just going to skip for time's sake down to verse 19, 219. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it, it, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? They didn't have the revelation. You have the revelation. They didn't have the revelation. But he was speaking of the temple, his body. And so my final scripture that, that I'm just going to quote, John 14, Jesus says this. Behold, he says, in my father's house, slow it down. Not, not in a hurry to get out of here. Behold, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Behold, I go and prepare. Remember David prepared for his son Solomon? Now, Jesus, the greatest son of David, is saying to you and I, Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. God is building a house. These are house rules. The biggest rule we got to understand now is praise, pray, prayer, praise, worship, uh, unity. And then we added this whole piece of having clean hands and a pure heart. Those are God's building material that he's going to build or he's going to build through us in the earth as he established a many member body formed and fashioned after our, our elder brother, Jesus, the firstborn among many, many brothers, that we might carry his glory in the earth or establish it. Because he said, as I live, the whole, the, the whole world will come to the knowledge of the glory of God. Well, my time is up. I'm out of time, but not out of thought. I thank you for sticking out, sticking around to the end of this lesson. I pray it's been a blessing to you. I thank God for you, for your lives. Look forward to you joining us on Sunday. As is our custom, we, we're putting some links below for you to connect with us, and for you to tell us if you got anything you want us to pray about. God bless you. I love you. Listen, just in case you came on this feed and you don't want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You got to this point. Why not go just a little bit further and try and understand Jesus as your Lord and Savior? So I, I've got one question for you. Have you considered Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you ever considered making Jesus the Lord of your life? It's easy to do. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him, the begotten son, shall not perish, but they shall have everlasting life. See, there, there are other people who are watching this who can tell you that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we understand that the wages of sin is death, but God's free gift is eternal life. How do I get there? Well, you have to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead on your behalf, that Jesus paid the penalty 
for your sin. And then you have to confess with your mouth that you believe that Jesus paid the price for you. I need you to understand, beloved, you are bought with a price. So tonight would be a good night. This afternoon in the USA, early morning in Asia, this would be a good day to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Have you considered making Jesus the Lord of your life? If you haven't, I invite you to do so. Hit us at the administrative link below because we love the opportunity to hear from you and to minister with you. We'll figure out how to call you or get in contact with you wherever you are around the world. We'll figure out how to get into touch with you just to talk to you and congratulate you and welcome you to the family of God. God blesses our prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for your people who are faithful and diligent. I pray now, God, that you would cause revelation to continue to flow. Even for those of us here in the UK, as we go to our beds tonight to sleep, I pray that our spirit man is alive and awake and beginning to turn over, meditating on this word that has been sown into their listening. I thank you, God, that you'll clear it all up and give us a will no more by tomorrow morning by our spirit than we will tonight by our head. Bless you, God. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Go in peace and continue to serve our great King. I love you. God bless you.